Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Home Daily for November 8th, 2017. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a bunch of news, including how Peak TV has led to anxiety, uh, Harry Potter Pokemon Go game, the cost of Blade Runner 2049's failure, the possible end of the Dark Universe. We didn't see that coming. Suicide Squad 2 rumors, a reaction to the new Steven Spielberg trailer, and Steven Soderbergh's interactive movie project. This is Peter Sreda, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film senior writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's up? And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Okay, guys, we got a lot of news to talk about, and there's actually some interesting stuff, even though it's been kind of slow news days. Um, but let's start this off with uh, the, let's get the comic book movie news out of the way. Uh, Suicide Squad might introduce Dwayne Johnson's Black Adam. Chris, what do we know about this? Right. So uh, even though they probably shouldn't be doing this, they're making a Suicide Squad 2. And uh, there's a rumor now that Dwayne Johnson's Black Adam will debut in that film. Um, Dwayne Johnson has been sort of attached to the character of Black Adam since 2007, at least. So it's been like 10 years where he's just been uh, holding out for to, to play this character. And uh, there's a plan to give him his own spin-off standalone movie, but it's looking like to introduce him for the first time, they're going to put him in Suicide Squad 2. DC not learn anything from Batman vs. Superman and how not to, to, to handle these character introductions? No, they didn't, they didn't <laughs> learn anything. I don't know. Everything about the story sounds bad. Suicide Squad 2, introducing Black Adam in Suicide Squad 2. Um, it, it, ben, try to convince me otherwise. Is, is there, like, why do it in that part of the DCEU? Hey, man, you're looking to the wrong source if you're looking for somebody (laughs) to try to convince you that they're making a good decision here. Because Suicide Squad 2 is already packed with people and then introducing another character who is weirdly a villain or, I guess, an anti-hero in his own right who's connected more with the Shazam franchise than Suicide Squad. It just, um, I don't know, it it seems like an odd decision. I hope that this does not end up happening, but... uh, but I don't know. Maybe they'll they'll find some way. Maybe it'll just be in like a post credit sequence or something, um, and and that would be totally fine because that's the kind of stuff that Marvel has been doing for years. You know, just like n- nothing that um, overwhelms the story that they're trying to tell. And I feel like Suicide Squad two needs all the help it can get just telling a coherent story after what we got the first time around. For sure, uh, Warner Brothers and the developer uh, developer of Pokemon Go have announced that they are making a Harry Potter Wizards Unite augmented reality game. Uh, Ben, you wrote this up for Slash Home. What what do we know about this new game? Yeah, not much other than it is, you know, officially it's been announced and it's supposed to come out in 2018 sometime. Uh, It comes from, I think the company is called Niantic Labs and it's, they're the, the developers behind Pokemon Go. So they obviously have some experience in the whole augmented reality realm. Uh, we don't really know any details about what Wizards Unite is going to be, but I mean, obviously anybody who's even, you know, remotely heard about Pokemon Go can probably guess the same sort of vibe is going to be applied, but with Harry Potter stuff instead of Pokemon stuff. Uh, TechCrunch has a report about this, and they say that there's likely to be significant influence on Wizards Unite from this game that um, the same company has created called Ingress, which is another location based ARG game that gives players the chance to quote, roam the real world, collecting power ups, defending locations and exploring their environment. So again, that's pretty much all the details we have about this at the moment. Um, Peter, do you think that Harry Potter is, I mean, obviously it seems like a, a big enough IP that this could make some waves in the ARG world. But do you think this is going to be a phenomenon on the level of Pokemon Go? Or was that just a one-time thing because that was like the first time that something like that had been seen on a global scale like that? I 
I mean, I don't think anything is going to be on the scale of uh, Pokemon Go in terms of a phenomenon. But uh, Harry Potter, if there is a fan base out there to make it possibly happen, is Harry Potter. I'm not sure if you guys have ever tried Pokemon Go. I did not really get into it, but I did try Ingress, which is the the one before that, as you mentioned. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what this is going to be because Ing- Ingress was kind of... Pokemon Go kind of took all the good things from Ingress. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually... The more I think about it, it's interesting that they're basing this... They're giving this a Harry Potter name and not a Fantastic Beast name. Because it seems like it would be easy to just copy Pokemon Go and have oh, it be right. about wizards going around capturing these Fantastic Beasts, you know, that are hidden, that we can't see in our reality. you got to use this, you know magic uh phone thing to to see in our world um Mm -hmm. uh i'm wondering if that's what it's going to be have you guys had any experience with pokemon go no no Um, no i i I never got into it no i know our own uh brad omen when we when we were at comic-con everywhere he went he was you know checking in on pokemon go and trying to capture capture the unique pokemon that are unique to California and not from where he was. Uh, it's al- almost like an obsession. Um, I, I, I've i heard that they've, like, added things to Pokemon Go where you actually can get things for, for doing, like, you know, get real-world things for doing things. I, I don't know much about it, but um, I'm wondering mm-hmm. if if this Harry Potter version, like, if you're good at the game, if you'll, like, unlock, you know maybe get a Harry Potter book sent to you or something. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just wondering what will convince people to play this um, over Pokemon Go, which probably already has a ton of users. You uh, know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they, um, like, debuted the trailer for Fantastic Beasts 2, you know, as, like, an unlockable thing, because this is, you know, it's not just um, Warner Brothers selling the licensing rights to this property out to a third party who's developing this game warner brothers is warner brothers interactive i should say is developing this game sort of in conjunction with niantic labs so uh it seems like it's at least partially still under that umbrella so maybe they could do something official you know sort of tying in with the upcoming movie i mean i do think augmented reality i think is the future today i think it was a report was released that Apple is looking to have a augmented reality headset by 2020. Um, who knows if that's true. But uh, I also think these real world games where you actually have to get out of your house and go to these locations and work together with other people that you may or may not know is very interesting. And um, I'm not sure it will drag me into it, but um, but I, I'm interested to follow it. Uh, but let's move on in the news to Blade Runner 2049. As you know, it was a box office failure. But how much money did it lose for Warner Brothers? Chris. Right. So, uh, yeah, according to a new story from The Hollywood Reporter, uh, Blade Runner could lose up to $80 million for its uh, producers. Basically, it's because it just could not recoup its money. And uh, I feel like... I, I want this to be like the last Blade Runner 2049 story for a while. I feel like every story since it's been released has just been, well, no one went to see this over and over again. And I really like this movie and it's just, it's depressing me that every story related to it has been about how it failed at the box office. I guess the question is, and I, I we've, we've talked about this lightly in the past in the podcast is, uh, why did Blade Runner 2049 fail? What, why do you think it, it mm. failed, Chris? I mean, it's a for one thing, the first Blade Runner, even though it's you know like a, a cult phenomenon, it wasn't like a a huge hit when it came out. It wasn't like a blockbuster. So I feel like even though it's become this iconic sort of influential movie, I also feel like the first movie isn't really it's not as like hot as I think the producers thought it was. And it's also you know Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It's a very dark brooding sort of film and i don't know if anyone's really in the mood for that right now it's also very long it's it's 164 minutes long and that can turn a lot of people off i mean i love the movie but even i yeah was like all right this is a bit long so and i think all those things just combine to just sort of sink it at the box office Ben, do you have any theories on why Blade Runner 2049 did not hit with the audiences? No, I think Chris covered it pretty well. I think the length probably had a lot to do with it. Um, and yeah, I, I, the, it's not an easy movie to just like 
pop in and check out. You know, you sort of have to, it makes you think, and it, it really is sort of a ponderous uh, experience. And it's not, it, it's not interested in giving you, you know, tons of action scenes and whatever. It, it's very, you know, it's much more of a cerebral kind of thing so yeah. and you know it's and I, like uh, in line with the first one in that regard and, and i imagine many millennials have tried to watch the original blade runner and have you know either checked out you know uh gone in their phones got bored you know what not not to to uh disparage an entire generation <laughs> yes which i which i guess <laughs> i am doing but I, I'm, I'm using the word millennial because uh you know the millennial generation was after Blade Runner came out. Um, and I think people that like, uh, went, were, you know, in their teenagers or older when Blade Runner came out and they saw it in the theater, it was kind of this big, huge thing to them. And it kind of was very influential in the movies that, uh, came after it in sci-fi. And I feel like young people today going back to watch Blade Runner, it kind of, because it's been copied so much, it doesn't seem as, original does that make sense because it's, mm -hmm. it's been uh copied to death by all these things and it, it is kind of like a movie from a different time with a different pace and uh i'm wondering if you know people tried to get excited for this movie and rewatch the original and decide you know maybe this franchise isn't for me um, yeah a lot of people have also pointed towards the marketing which revealed almost nothing it was kind of like just a visual and tonal feast um mm -hmm. as a as a reason um, do, do either of you think that, that that could be why people didn't go, that that they didn't show enough? Yeah, I, I could see that. The, the marketing was very vague. Um, they were very uh, tight-lipped about spoilers. And, you know, while I appreciate that on one level, I also realize that the average moviegoer wants a bit more than just like a bunch of images in a trailer. They want to know what they're going to see. And the trailers really didn't do a good job of selling that. Yeah, I love the marketing campaign, but I think it was designed more for me than it was for mainstream audiences. It, it, it is weird because the marketing campaign kind of, I mean, it did. It totally ran with Harrison Ford and revealing he's in the movie. And you had to do that. You know, he's, you have to put his name on the poster. You have to put him at the junket and stuff. Um, but I feel like that was so much of a late movie reveal if you, you, know, you mm -hmm. if you hadn't seen the marketing. Whereas... I think the trailers didn't really reveal much until like what Kay's case, what, what what the main story was, what the inciting incident of the movie is. And I feel like um, maybe they should have uh, included some some information of what this movie is. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, but let's move on. Uh, a new tra Speaking of marketing, a new trailer has come out for Steven Spielberg's film, The Post. Uh, we Ben, you wrote an article about this, and uh, we, we have all seen this trailer, so we're going to give our reactions to this trailer right now. So if you haven't seen it, you can stop and watch it on SlashFilm.com. Um, I guess uh, up first, uh, you know, I'll say, you know, obviously any time a Steven Spielberg movie comes around, I think it's fair to say that all three of us are going to be in a theater to see it uh, opening weekend or before opening weekend at a press screening. Um you know, it's always an exciting time to to see a movie, even if it's you know one of his. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if this is going to be one of his better films. It doesn't. Uh, I don't know. It, it looks more of you know Spielberg kind of does like three types of films, and this is like kind of the historical. I, I feel like Spielberg, in a way, has almost taken a responsibility of wanting to be a um, a history teacher. Uh, through pop culture to you know, you know the the masses, and I, I think this is another one of those. Uh, obviously, this you know, there's tons of scenes with people talking in dark rooms with light streaming through the windows and fluorescent lights, and uh, you know, there's a spotlight vibe to this, even though obviously this takes place in a earlier time. Um, you know, the performances look great. Um, I'm like, I'm excited to see it, but I'm not like you know chomping at the bit to see it. Uh, ben, how about you? I definitely think it looks more of like the uh, the Bridge of Spies um, vibe, where it's just adults doing their jobs really well, and that's something that Spielberg uh, has seemed to be drawn to as a storyteller. Um, and I, I mean, I think you're right, Peter, but I also about uh, Spielberg wanting to maybe be a history teacher, but I also feel like. Um, 
yeah, I wouldn't rather, you know, who else, who else would you want to teach you these stories in, in such a, uh, a compelling fashion? I, I feel like I would love to take a history class from Steel, Steven Spielberg. And that's basically what these movies are. So, um, you, you know, what, let, cast... let me respond oh, to that really quick. Uh, you know, I, I, I do agree with you, but Steven Spielberg is such a talented filmmaker. He's one of the most talented filmmakers of our time. And I feel like movies like Bridge of Spies or this film could be done justice by many filmmakers. Maybe not on the level of Steven Spielberg, but like I feel like I feel feel like Spielberg's talents aren't on full display here. I uh, I don't really like this trailer, uh, but I think it's just a, a, a case of just sloppy marketing because I didn't really like the trailers for Bridge of Spies either. And then I thought that movie was kind of like a masterpiece. Uh, I mean, I love Spielberg. I love I, I love his his history lesson movies, honestly. And um, I mean, the cast of this movie is phenomenal. Uh, I mean, everything about this excites me it's, it's a, a timely story even though it's set in the 70s it obviously very much applies to uh the situation we find ourselves in now as a uh, as a country all that stuff so i'm definitely going to be there whenever the press screening comes out i'm very excited to see it but the trailer did underwhelm me just a little bit ben you had additional thoughts on this right well i was just going to say that i think uh I think to your point about maybe somebody else could have directed a movie like this or like Bridge of Spies, I feel like that's what makes Spielberg such a fascinating director is like, of course, he has the um, the ability to go off and make huge, colossal movies that nobody else could possibly you know, approach. But at the same time, he slots in little films like this where he got this together so fast. They started shooting this. Uh, in May, he attached himself to it in March of this year, and it's going to be out in December. So this is like an, an incredibly quick production with, as Chris mentioned, a cast of like the highest caliber. And I love that Spielberg is, you know, he, he's a guy who's always looking. He's always um, curious and he finds something that interests him and he thinks, oh, this is a story that needs to be told right now. And he actually makes it happen right now for, you know, before, um, the cultural moment that he's trying to comment on can pass. He already has a movie out where it, you know, captures the the zeitgeist perfectly. So uh, I I sort of love that about him. No, I do I do think that's the smartest thing about this movie is you know it is such a movie uh, uh, commenting on the time that we are in now. Um, I'm excited to see it. It's just uh, I wish he was doing more films kind of like on the intersection of spectacle and smart, you know, Mm -hmm. the more, uh, I don't know. It's interesting. I feel like recently we've been seeing him do like either things that are too broad, kind of like, um, Oh my God. What the BFG or Tin Mm -hmm. Tin. And then we see him do stuff like this, which I think, um, are probably not, uh, exciting enough for general audiences. Yeah, it doesn't really have a much of a sexy factor, but I I do think it's going to be a great movie. So we'll see. No, I I, I do not doubt that. Um, so in the most shocking news of this decade, it turns out that the dark universe at Universal Pictures might actually be dead. Chris, what do we know about this? Right. So uh, Universal they wanted to get in on the the cinematic universe game and. They realized they actually already owned what what was the very first cinematic universe, which was the Universal Monsters universe, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, all those movies. So uh, instead of saying, let's turn these into horror movies, they decided to make them really bad action blockbusters. I don't know why. And they started off with The Mummy, and it was terrible. And (laughs) no one saw it. And uh, as a result, the, the, it sort of put the whole dark universe on hold. They were supposed to start uh, pre-production on the next film, which was Bride of Frankenstein. With we, um, we, we should say the Mummy did uh, better overseas, so they they we we had assumed that they were going full forward with us, but right, yes. So yeah, it, it did poor domestically, I should say. So they were going to keep going with Bride of Frankenstein, directed by Bill Condon, and then. 
literally right before they were supposed to start pre-production, they pulled the plug and told all the all the crew to go home, basically. And then today comes news that Alex Kurtzman and Chris Morgan, who were sort of like the architects of the Dark Universe, have both left. They've both left it behind. And now pretty much no one knows what's going to become of it. It's almost safe to assume that it's either going to be forgotten completely or Universal is going to try to turn them into standalone movies. The uh, The story mentions that there's, they're considering maybe getting Jason Blum from Blumhouse involved to make smaller standalone films sort of part of a, a big cinematic universe. But other than that, it, it really seems like the dark universe as they pitched it is dead. Uh, is that a good thing, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't even see the mummy because I heard such bad things about it. So I guess I, I'm not maybe the most qualified person to, uh, to speak to that. But from everything I heard, that film is just sort of, uh, you know, super bland and uh, an uninspired start to a cinematic universe. So even though Bill Condon is a guy who clearly has a lot of love for you know that era of universal filmmaking and uh is probably a a pretty good choice to direct a bride of frankenstein movie it seems like the rest of what they had planned was not exactly the most uh exciting lineup you know giving johnny depp a starring role and the invisible man seemed like a mistake um and uh, yeah it it probably is a good thing that they're at least putting the brakes on this thing. I do think uh, Jason Blum could probably do something interesting with like a sort of a, a one-off uh, take on one of those types of movies. So I would definitely be more interested in seeing that than anything that would be considered, you know, part of the dark universe proper at this point. Yeah. I could see him doing like the creature from the black lagoon or something like that. Um it seems like the mummy was the worst idea to you know kickstart this universe, and I think that they uh, they put too much a too many eggs in this basket. It seemed like they were too confident about this going in. They should have just you know gone in, not called it the dark universe, not you know now that they you know that those eggs in the basket. Now they have all those eggs on their face, and mm-hmm. because of a. Uh, you know the the box office of that movie and the critical reaction to that movie. Um, it it seems like they they should have just hinted at a little bit more, but instead that movie you know kind of not doubles down but triples down. You know they they introduce Russell Crowe as a kind of almost like the, the role that Nick Fury played in the Marvel movies. He plays in in the Mummy and in all these movies that will never happen now. Um, apparently, uh, I don't know. It just seems like. It just seemed like it was it was the bad. It, it, I, I I I'm I'm in for the end game. I would have been excited to see a movie where all the universe monsters get together after we we had seen their standalones, but it seemed like uh, the way that they executed the setup, at least in the Mummy, was not um, was not good. It was not the the, the right direction to go in. Yeah, but um. Moving on uh, to, to another trailer, there is a trailer out for Steven Soderbergh's next film. Pro- is it a project? Is it a film? Is it an app? What What is it, Ben? So it's called Mosaic, and it is ultimately going to be a six-part limited series that debuts on HBO on January 22nd, 2018. But right now... It's also an app, and you can download this Mosaic app for free, uh, I think, on... Um, iPhone, iPad, and Apple TV and an Android version is going to be coming up pretty soon. Um, but the app is like a – so Mosaic is like – it's a story. It's a it's an interactive experience that Soderbergh has put together. And the app allows you to watch the story in whatever order you want, sort of. Like you get to pick. It's like a branching narrative kind of thing. So I downloaded the app. I actually haven't had a chance to watch any of it yet because I've been working today. But uh, when I downloaded it, you sign up and you the first thing you see is... Um, this branching thing that looks sort of like an infographic with lines going, you know, splitting off from different uh, potential video hubs. And if you click the top one, you're introduced to Sharon Stone's character, who's like the main, uh, the main, the female lead in this ongoing story. And 
the first video that you have to watch, it tells you it's 25 minutes long. So I was going to like watch it on my lunch break or something, but it was a little bit too long for that. So um, I haven't actually had a chance to sit there and sit down and watch any of this yet. But once you do that, then there's, you know, two things, two other videos split off from there. And you can watch, you can pick which perspective of these different characters involved in this overarching murder mystery that you want to follow. So it's a, it's a really fascinating sort of thing. And Soderbergh himself has said that, you know, branching narratives is no is not new, but the idea of creating an app and letting people do it this way and sort of explore this world um, in their own way is something that he was really excited about. He's been working on this for three years with a writer named Ed Solomon, who wrote Men in Black. Um, so yeah, it's, it's done and you can watch it. You can go through this whole thing right now. You can go back through and sort of pick different, you know, make different decisions to see how the narrative changes. Uh, they shot a bunch of different scenes from multiple perspectives to sort of, um, allow for the objectivity of, you know, whichever character you're choosing going through this, this scene. So the trailer sort of gives you a a hint of what the overall story is like, but I'm really excited to sort of dive into this and take a closer look. Okay, I have some questions here. <laughs> um, so in the app now, can you watch the whole series? It seems like you can. And because um, because the only one that you have uh, available to, it, it basically all of the videos are locked until you do them, until you get introduced to the characters. So they force you to watch the one about Sharon Stone's character ah. first because she's the main character. So I was wondering, you know, because it says that video is 25 minutes long. So I was clicking on some of the later ones to see if they were an hour long or 25 minutes. So I can, you know, add everything up and see if it comes out to a six hour uh, experience like the the limited series will presumably be. But all of those things are locked until I watch the introductions of the, the main characters. Um, I guess it says technically that it's a six part limited series. So maybe each part is only half an hour and that would make it three hours in total. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it's either it's probably either a three hour or a six yeah. hour thing. And I think you can watch all of it on on the through the app right now. OK, so here's my second question, Ben, which you might not know the answer to. When this six part series premieres on HBO, is there any perspective change there? Are you like is one episode perspective of one person this whole story? Like, do you know? How that's going to be presented? Um, yeah, that is an interesting question. Uh, let me see exactly what the uh, press release says about that. It says, viewers will be able to see how their versions of the story on the app ultimately compare to Soderbergh's when HBO Films presents Mosaic as a six-part limited series on January 22nd. So it seems like he shot a bunch of different stuff and lets the audience have the opportunity to explore it however they want and sort of explore different versions of the story. And then he just picked the one that he liked the best, and that's the one that they're going to present on HBO. But there, I guess there might be extra stuff that you see on the app that you don't have access to if he chose a different path than you do. I don't know. It, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of tough to talk yeah. about when I haven't actually watched anything yeah, yeah. yet. This is so interesting. I'm wondering why they wouldn't, you know, allow on HBO Go the the option to, you know, do the, the, this branching because I'm sure that would be easy to do on like HBO Go, um, maybe not on HBO, you know, yeah, <laughs> on, on cable. But um, uh, I don't know. Soderbergh is hit or miss with me, but uh, this kind of choose your own perspective storytelling is something I've always been fascinated with. I've, I've never seen the, the play sleep no more. Uh, I think it was in New York city, but it took place in, I think in an apartment building and the people, uh, there were the spectators watching this play could go room to room and follow the characters that they want to follow and see just, you know, just a slice of the story that they want to see. And I, I always thought that was interesting. I thought this is kind of, um, the promise of virtual reality storytelling for me is the idea of being able to, you know, do a story that's like an intertwined story, like, you know, Pulp Fiction or go or, you know, stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. being able to choose, you know, how you view it. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, I, I, I love Soderbergh. I'll definitely be watching the series when it airs, but, I don't know, this will make me sound lazy, but it just sounds like way too much work. Like, I don't <laughs> I don't really want to 
go through an app and select something. Like, I don't know. When I'm watching something, I just want to watch it. I don't really want to interact with it that way. I, I know some people like that, but it's not really for me. It's like the same thing with like VR. Like I have no real interest in ever getting into VR and they keep trying to push it. Like every, every uh, film festival now has at least one segment that's like devoted to VR movies. And I just have no a VR interest. Movie just won uh, Academy award or something, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And I don't know. I just, I can't get into that. I don't know. I don't know if I'm just being stubborn or what, but it just, it just seems like, Seems like an extra amount of effort that I'm not willing to put in. Um, I, I've always believed that, um, you know, I'm kind of a snob that somewhat looks down upon storytelling in video games because I, I kind of believe that storytelling is at its best when it's presented through the point of view of an auteur who is guiding every single choice in what you're seeing and doing. And I think when you have a video game, I'm sure people are going to be mad at me saying this. Okay. In a video game, you're making choices. So you are not experiencing the story in the exact po- perfect way to experience the drama and, you know, setups and payoffs and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I know that there's, you know, I, I've, I've played and watched, you know, some of the best video games out there. And I know that there's, you know, more cinematic ways of, of doing it and the, the video game developers are more in control of it than it seems, but it, it still seems to me that, um, you know, this story seems a lot like Gone Girl, kind of like that same kind of setup. Um, and it seems to me if, you know, I was watching Gone Girl and I could follow certain characters around that Fincher didn't follow around or take their perspectives, it wouldn't have been as good as God girl. Mm -hmm. Ben, any thoughts? Uh, I mean, I think you're, I I understand where you're coming from. Um, I just, I feel like they're, they're trying for something new here. And Soderbergh has said like, he's excited to see what other people do with this technology as well. Um, I think he sort of developed uh, a lot of this, you know, the groundwork, lay the groundwork with this app. And, and I, I think they're sort of opening it up to other, you know, high level storytellers. So maybe this particular story is not going to do it for you, but maybe somebody else will come along and give you the option to, you know, have that experience in that way. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to see it. It's so new that th- there's not really much we can say about it yet. And also another thing that bothers me about video games, which would bother me with this, uh, project is they in, in the end presu- presumably you'd be experiencing something that's very different than you know other people are experiencing and you'd probably be not see some scenes and sections of the story and i feel like a, a, as a add person like me i want to see it all mm-hmm. <laughs> i, I want to experience it all and uh I, I feel like that would uh bother me but speaking of uh add and anxiety uh peak television is apparently giving people more anxiety than ever before chris you wrote this up about this new study what do we know right so i, I won't quote percentages because you know i don't, I don't know if, <laughs> that just sounds dull but you could go read this on slashfilm.com where the story is but the Hub Entertainment Research Group basically did a study of, of just TV viewers, and the, the results stated that because there's just so much TV now, there's just so many TV shows that it's literally giving viewers anxiety because they don't know what they should pick. And it's sort of like they, they feel anxious that they can't watch everything, so they, they'd rather just watch nothing. It's sort of getting to that point. And there was even a result that said because there's – so many TV shows now, people are a lot less likely to start new TV shows unless they're 100% sure they actually know they're going to like it, basically. So they're, they're even they're, – they're willing to try less new things because there's just so much of it. Ben, you have some thoughts on peak television. <laughs> well, yeah, that's I was going to say that sounds pretty familiar because that sort of describes the way that I go about watching TV right now because it, there is like so much good stuff out there that you're always hearing about and you only, there's so only, only so many hours in the day and you know only so many shows that you can watch at any given time. So I tend to I'm not really anxious about peak TV, but I definitely am, am more picky as a viewer because of it. Um, I'll typically wait until 
you know, I hear really good things about at least the first, I don't know, five or six episodes of a show or something instead of just diving in. And, you know, there are rare occasions where I'll just dive in. Like I watched Westworld as it was airing. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, because there's just so much stuff out there, I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm sort of uh, one of these people that Chris seems to be talking about. See, I I I think I'm a little bit different. I have uh, I have commitment issues is, you know, I will dive into almost anything and check it out and see if it's any good. And I have problems committing to any show because, you know, I know that, oh, this new show is on Hulu, this new show on Netflix, you know, I, I got to check that out. I got to check this, you know, that's probably better. And I don't end up finishing as much. I end up, you know, watching one or two episodes of something. And um, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm the guy at the LA party that like is talking to someone while looking, you know, looking over their shoulder, looking for the other person in the room that might be <laughs> more important. Yeah. I'm that guy. <laughs> So you're the total dick in the room. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Chris, how about you? Yeah, uh, unless I'm like reviewing a show, I very rarely will start something new unless I've heard really good things about it, or even or even like after it ended. Like The Good Place is a show I didn't watch that first season at all. It's because you know, I, I'm I'm so hesitant to start new things, but everyone kept telling me, "Oh, this is really good." So when it showed up on Netflix. My wife and I went ahead and like binge the whole season, and it was really good. But uh, it's very hard to make that commitment. It's 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 a lot of effort. I mean, you know, effort is in quotes because you're really just sitting watching something. But it does take a lot of effort to just commit to a new show when there are so many things. Yeah, and I feel like even even you know. I've mentioned, you know, I was a big fan of the first two seasons of Narcos and then the third season came on and it has, you know, different villain, different kind of storyline. And, you know, I watched a couple episodes and, you know, other things caught my eye, Stranger Things too, you know, whatever. And I, I haven't gotten back to it. And, you know, that should be something I, that should be on my priority list. But there's just so much peak television out there. Uh, I'd be interested to hear how you, the the listeners, uh, think about peak TV. Is it giving you anxiety? Uh, is it giving you commitment issues? Uh, does it make you watch less or more? Um, I'd be interested to hear that. You can send it to peter at slashfilm.com, and you can send all your questions for the mailbag, peter at slashfilm.com. Chris, where can we find more of your work online? I'm also at slashfilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at cevangelista413. And how about you, Ben? And you can find me at Slash Film, and I am on Twitter at Ben Pears. You can find me on Twitter at Slash Film. You can find all the stories we mentioned today on SlashFilm.com and linked in the show notes. This podcast is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, please go to iTunes, give us a rating, give us a review. That helps us out quite a bit, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>